I'd, I'd like to start first of all by um, asking a rhetorical question. Why do we assess our students? Uh, and I'm not sure that we always stop to think about this because it's always been a part of the learning process. It's something that we do automatically. Um, and we never really, you know, perhaps don't question why we do this. Um, it's something that often ha uh, happens at the end of the learning process. So we do the teaching and then we do the assessing. Uh, and, and I think back to my own educational experience as well. And I, I don't have really happy memories of exams. Uh, and exams are often equated with assessments. When somebody says assessment or evaluation, we tend to think of an exam and we tend to think of sitting in silence with a, a pen and paper. And I don't think any of us have particularly happy memories of, of doing this, uh, but I do have happy memories of being assessed in other ways. Uh, I do have very happy memories of receiving feedback from, uh, from classmates, of giving feedback on classmates' work and things like this. So what I'm going to try to do today is invite you to think about assessment as something that we do for our students instead of something that we do to our students. And hopefully, even though it sounds like quite a, 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 it sounds like a fantasy, a utopian idea, to make assessment an integral part of the teaching learning process, but also a part which students actually won't mind doing that much. So to that end, first of all, to try and get you into the mindset of thinking a little bit more about why we assess our students, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, and we're going to open the poll for you now. Uh, there are eight potential reasons. They're not the only reasons why we assess our students, but they're some of the reasons. And what I'd like you to do in the poll now is to choose which of these you consider to be most important. I know it's a difficult task because some of them you might think are equally important or are very much linked and hard to separate. But if you could choose just one, which one do you think would be the most important? important for you. A couple of minutes and your answers in the poll, please. Okay, so yeah, we'll we'll give people a little bit of time to, to answer this question. As Matthew said, uh, just choose one option from A to H, um, one option which you think is the most important. And answers are coming in, but we'll give people a little bit more time. Yes, I see F and G. Yeah. Coming up. Uh, leading followed at the moment, yeah. Yes, followed by C. And then uh, E and H. Actually, E is a little bit more, yeah. And OK. Uh -huh. Right. It Excellent. keeps changing, but it looks like we pretty it much have like, a winner. Yeah, we do. Yes, I think we have. Okay, so uh, interesting. So we have uh, G appears to be the most popular option, giving my students information about their progress. Uh, great answer. That's the kind of thing I was uh, I was hoping to uh, to hear from you. Um, sometimes I wonder is that the answer that you think you ought to give, or is that genuinely? uh it, what what you think no because sometimes even in my own experience even as a teacher myself uh if i stop and think about it maybe I, maybe that's why i should be doing it um but perhaps there are other things in here which uh, we also on a day-to-day -day basis consider to be uh equal as equally as important uh, I, i'm glad that the grade is uh has only got two percent here because the grade of course is very uh, it's very limited information, really. Um, so if we move on to the uh, what I consider to be the correct answers, uh, and correct is in inverted commas here because of, there is no correct answer, of course, and all of the all but one of the reasons I think are valid reasons for assessing our students. But in my opinion, uh, the, towards uh, the top, you know, the things that we should be assessing, uh, or the reasons why we should be assessing students. Uh, for reasons that help them to learn uh, about their own improvement, about their own development, and also help us to reflect as teachers as well. Now, the, the reflecting on our own teaching is something that didn't get a lot of votes. So perhaps not the most important, but certainly important. So 
the things that I consider to be very important here, I put in green. So um, my first reaction whenever I assess my students, if they don't perform very well, uh, I think there are probably two possible uh, reasons for this that come to mind. First of all, we think, ha, they didn't study. But really, I think the main thing that we should be thinking perhaps is, did I, what did I do wrong? Did I do everything? What did, was, uh, did, was the exam too difficult? Did I put things on the exam that we didn't really cover? Did they understand the questions? Did I uh, assess them in the same way that I taught them? Uh, that thing that I taught them that I thought they'd all understood, now it appears that they didn't. So it's important also to reflect on, uh, on our own efficiency uh, as well, I think. And the other three that are in green, C, E, and G, um, I think are all related. Now, they're all related to the one that came out as the winner, which was giving my students information about their progress. Uh, that's information for them. But of course, we also receive that information. So that helps us and them to identify specific problems so that we can uh, resolve the situation or, or, or help them to get better at their, their weak points. Uh, and a big part of this talk is this idea of monitoring um, students' progress and motivating them and encouraging them to take their learning seriously. Because as we'll see later, I don't think there's anything more motivating than success. And one of the things that we need to do is to make students aware of their small incremental gains, their small successes. So doing a little bit better than they did last time uh, can have a very powerful motivating effect. Now you'll notice here that there are a couple that I've put in red and those are I, I think not really uh, valid reasons, particularly D, the one that I've crossed out. Uh, and I sometimes suspect that this goes on. Um, and if we threaten students with, okay, you're not behaving well today, so tomorrow you're going to have a test, or okay, that's it, you're behaving really uh, really poorly, you're making a lot of noise, sit down, I'm going to give you a surprise test. If we do this kind of thing, and I know this kind of thing happens, if we do it, then we're sending the message that assessment is a negative thing and it's like a punishment. I often give the uh, analogy, I, I give the comparison of, uh, of what students or what children eat, for example. Now, if we punish children by making them eat apples, or we punish children by making them read books, then we're giving the idea that apples and books are bad. Um, and as I said in the introduction, um, our own experience of being assessed is normally not a happy one. We don't think happy thoughts when we think about uh, an exam. Uh, and that's not conducive to our best performance and to doing as well as possible in an assessment task. So I think we should definitely be trying to think about uh, uh, eliminating this idea or trying to eliminate this idea from classrooms that assessment is, is inherently a, a bad thing or an unpleasant thing. Giving each student a grade is in orange, uh, is in amber. Uh, a grade can be useful information, but it's not enough information on its own. So a student being given a seven, Culturally in Spain, that means something. We know what a seven means. Some students are very happy with a seven, some students not so happy with a seven, but a seven is a decent performance. However, unless we know why that's a decent performance and what could be done between achieving a seven and achieving a 10, then the number alone is really only shorthand to the range of performance, but it's not enough information to feed into the learning process and to uh, to help him to help improve. Uh, in uh, H, I think getting students ready for an external examination for the reasons that Louise mentioned in her introduction can be very powerful and can be very motivating. It's good to have these moments in life when you measure yourself, and particularly if you are successful, then it can keep that motivation high. And if you're not successful, hopefully it can give you information that will be helpful for your future improvement. You know, give both the student and the, uh, the, the teacher that kind of information. And in F, you'll notice that I just underlined in red one little thing. And I just wanted to make a distinction here that measuring what students have learned is 
summative assessment. It's assessment of learning. It happens at the end of the process and it tells us what the students did or did not learn. However, if we change this to measuring what students are learning, then it's a subtle difference, but an important one, because that suggests that it's an integrated part of the process. It's not divorced from the process. It doesn't happen at the end. It happens along the way. And that we would characterize as formative assessment or assessment for learning. So it's the assessment that helps you to learn, not the assessment that just sees at the end of the process whether you have learned or not. So, as I said, I think the ones that are in green are the, the, the prime reasons, the principal reasons why we should be uh, assessing our students. Now, if we move on for a moment, I'll give you a, a second to read this slide, because this sometimes is the reality, I think. And this is related to uh, using assessment uh, as a threat, using it for discipline, which is really sending the, the wrong message, I think. The next one, again, I'll give you a second to read this. Again, this refers to what we were saying about the difference between assessment for learning and in this case assessment of learning we do the teaching and the assessment sometimes is an afterthought assessment with traps i've always very found it very strange and i've never encountered this before the multiple choice test where your wrong answers, your incorrect answers, lose you points. I've always felt that that was a very strange way to think about assessment because it encourages students to focus on what they haven't learned or what they're not, not sure about rather than taking chances. So, you know, the idea that you have 100 questions and you get 80 correct but 20 wrong and then you get a six because those 20 questions took a point away from the things that you did know, I think is inherently unfair and it's a trap really and it discourages students from taking chances and from, uh, and from trying. Um, so yeah, this is the kind of thing that I think we should definitely be avoiding as well when we think that assessment is something we do for them and it's part of the learning process. And the final one, alienated students, this is something, as I said before, that we do to students rather than for them. And they often have no participation in this process. They're victims of it. Uh, it's imposed upon them. And again, when something is imposed upon you, you don't look at it necessarily in a very positive way. So again, this is something which I, which I strongly believe we should try to change by involving students. And we'll look uh, join the talk at ways that we can do this as well. Simple ways, required no work really, um, just uh, simple ways that we can involve them. So now I'd like to ask you uh, another question. I can pass the slide. Okay, it's confession time. So um, again, we're opening the, the uh, option now for you to, to confess. I consider the four things that we've just seen as crimes against assessment. And I'd like to hear your confessions, please. Have you been guilty of any of these? I know I have. I try not to be guilty anymore. I try not to commit those crimes. If you have been guilty, please give us a brief example. And after what we've or what you've just heard me talk about, how do you feel about it now? Has your mind been changed in any way? Okay, so this is a have your say, the open-ended question, uh, which will appear on your screen now. And all you need to do is write a short answer. So have you ever been guilty? And perhaps describe one of the um, examples. And how do you feel about it now? And while we're waiting for answers to come in, Matthew, I must admit I'm guilty of all of them <laughs> at one point or I another during my career, uh, which hasn't been a short one, so I suppose. Yeah, 
<laughs> it's inevitable, so no? <laughs> You've you've committed a lot of crimes in in, I've in that time. I've committed an awful. I've committed all the crimes there are, um, and somebody uh, else is agreeing with me. To somebody is saying to test students just because they misbehaved, and I thought they deserved a punishment. Yes, I've done that as well. Another person is saying case, sometimes the, <laughs> it is, isn't it? And somebody else is saying sometimes the level of the test was higher than the students' level, so. In a way, it was a trap to catch the mouse. Yeah. That's that's uh, a very interesting one. That's a very interesting one, actually. I'd like to comment on that because it is true that sometimes we, uh, you know, we should only really be testing, I think, to be fair, what students have learned. And I know there's a tendency sometimes to put a couple of extra questions on the exam, which we know they probably won't know, but that hopefully will distinguish between the really motivated students who go away from class and, and and dig deeper into the topic. But I, I sometimes think that is a bit of a trap, really, if students don't know that that's expected of them. Yes. Now, a couple of people are admitting to the um, penalizing uh, method in exams, uh, especially in what yeah. you mentioned before, the multiple choice tests. More than one yeah. person is saying, is saying that they've been guilty of that. Um, that it's a natural. I, I, yes. I, I have this discussion with colleagues sometimes, and I always ask them, "Why do you do that?" And they say, "Ah, it's to take away the element of chance," and they feel that's the justification. And I say, yes. my response to that is. In that case, why are you giving a test in which there is an element of chance? Perhaps exactly. it's the wrong type of test. There shouldn't, luck should not be involved. When we think about why we assess students, one of the reasons, uh, assessment is essentially research. It has to be valid and reliable and objective and give us information which is of use for us and for the students. And if there's an element of luck, then perhaps that information is not really helpful for anybody involved. Exactly, exactly. And one other person is saying that they've been guilty with their second of bachillerato students of setting exams that had tricky questions and that they now uh -huh. feel guilty. Well, don't worry, we're all in the same boat. We've all been through this. And this is an yeah, opportunity I... for us now to reflect and perhaps think about you know, um, think about what what the function of assessment is and how we can use it as a tool to to yeah. empower learning and our teaching. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't un, until somebody points this out. It's not obvious. And I think when you do realize this, you tend to become a reformed criminal or a rehabilitated <laughs> criminal. And, and when you're aware of it, you, you stop doing it and you think about uh, assessment in a, in a different light. So that's my, my main exactly. goal today now to, uh, to, to, to raise the point. Great. OK, so there are several things that we can do to improve the assessment process, I think. And the first one is, is this. It's, it's being fair. And, you know, the crimes of, against assessment are all really down to a, a lack of fairness, not being fair to our students. If the first step I would say, the first thing we can do is to be fair and to reduce the risk. And I would say to reduce the stress as well, because it's only in, in, in academic situations, school situations, where we are under exam conditions in silence with a limited amount of time to show what we can do. Um, and I think one way that we can involve students, one of the things that I said, one way to get them involved in the process is giving them options about when to be assessed. So, you know, if you have classes on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays with them, ask them. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it makes it might not make a lot of difference for us to say, OK, well, we'll do the test on Friday. OK, well, we'll do the test on Tuesday, whatever the class decides. It's a, it's the, the important thing is they do it. And we can give them a, a limited range of choices. And the thing is that all of those choices are acceptable to us. So if they want the test on Tuesday or they want the test on Friday, that's fine by me. Uh, perhaps um, giving them an option on what to be assessed on. 
So whenever I've prepared students for taking exams, you know, I ask them, I say, okay, next week, what should we do? Do you want to focus more on listening? Should we focus more on, on, on reading? Do you need to work on writing? What do you, and, and to, um, you know, to, to encourage them, to survey them, to, to you know, to, to negotiate with them rather than imposing it upon them. And those are two very, very simple things that we can, that we can do. Now, you know, maybe they hate listening and never want to do it. Well, sorry, that's not part of the deal. You know, we have to do three listenings. So, you know, you can decide a little bit uh, when to do them. And the third point, uh, and I mentioned assessment being a little bit like research, is um, thinking about what counts. Now, the thing with assessments, the thing with tests is that anybody can have a bad day. So one thing that I like to do is to test my students Let's say, for example, I want to test their listening. Well, I might give them uh, four listening tests during a semester, but they get to choose one that doesn't count. So, for example, they've done four and they get a seven, an eight, a seven, and a four. Okay, well, we forget the four because that obviously was not representative of their ability, and if we include it, it reduces their, it reduces their mark, it reduces their grade, okay? Now, you know, imagine they got a seven, a six, a four, and a four. Okay, well, they get to lose one of those four, so their final mark is a, a seven, a six, and a four, or whatever. So I think this reduces risk because the students know that they can have a bad day, they can have one at least, and they know that it's not going to count and it's not going to harm them, right? So I would say these are three things really that we can do just to make assessment feel a little bit more fair for them. Now, we've talked about formative assessments, about assessment for learning. So it's this dream idea that assessments can help them learn if it's integrated in, in uh, an effective way in the learning process. And there are five things which I think we need to do, and we're going to look at five, we're going to look at ways that we can achieve these five things. So involving them in their learning, well, to start with, this giving them an element of choice involves them a little bit in their learning. Uh, increasing motivation and self-esteem. Well, the motivation to do the exam or to do the test or to do the assessment task, but also the motivation to continue learning. And in the poll that you did at the beginning, quite a few of you thought that motivating students to take their learning seriously was important. Um, and like I said, nothing motivates like success. So anything we can do to improve their self-esteem is going to have positive effects on their learning. Providing effective feedback. Like I said, a seven is not feedback. A nine is not feedback. Um, I have colleagues sometimes say, you know, I, I had a student who got a 9.5 and I can't believe that they came to the exam revision uh, to talk to me. They should be happy with a 9.5. And my idea is always the student wants to know why didn't they get a 10? What, did, what should they have done in order to get a 10? Um, so, you know, effective feedback is, is crucial in this, and we're going to look at ways of doing this as well. Outlining how to improve. Sometimes assessment happens too late. You know, you have an, asses you have an assessment task or an exam at the end of, a, end of a unit, and then you don't do very well, but, you know, everybody turns the page and goes on to the next unit anyway. Well, perhaps some of the things you didn't do well in that unit and knowing about them and knowing how to improve them can help you perform better on the next one. Um, and the other thing that formative assessment must do is, uh, is allow for adjustment. So results are not just results. They don't just happen at the end. They are things which we can use to our advantage and to our students' advantage. So we're going to look at ways that we can achieve these. Um, and this one, uh, you know, is one of the big ideas here. Assessment is something that they are involved in rather than something that is done to them. So um, assessment criteria... Sometimes we have control over these. Sometimes if it's an external exam, for example, the TOEFL primary test, then the assessment criteria are already established. But if we are aware of what they are, then we can use that to our advantage. But for the kind of assessment we do in class, um, if we, let's say, for example, you wanted your students to do a short two-minute or three-minute oral presentation about something, one thing that can help them a lot is to know exactly the criteria for a successful presentation. And if we brainstorm with them and get their ideas and they collaborate and cooperate in forming those uh, criteria, then, of course, this has a very powerful 
uh, effect on them internally because you know they've come up with this they're already conscious they're already aware, aware of what they need to do well um, assessing peers when I say assessing I don't necessarily mean giving their classmates marks because that can always provide tension and friction but giving your classmates uh, crit you know good critical feedback good positive feedback uh, when I teach students to give feedback I always say okay first of all talk about the things you liked and then secondly tell them about uh, suggestions for improvement uh, and this can have a very powerful metacognitive effect because if you're using the criteria that you have collaborated in forming to assess your classmate and you know you are going to be assessed with the same criteria then it really helps raise your awareness and your consciousness of what it is you need to do well and that brings us on to the third point of them assessing themselves so after they've done something them telling you how they thought they did and importantly why now I'm going to explain briefly what we have here is a, uh, a speaking question from the TOEFL primary exam I'll just give you a little bit of background because this is a screenshot um, and what the students or what the candidates see here is the image in the top left uh, first of all animated and then the image in the top right animated and then the bottom left and the bottom right and those are the four steps for feeding the birds and then the lady asks them okay I didn't see that I don't know how to feed the birds can you explain to me how to do it and they have 30 seconds to explain how to feed the birds now we're going to open a have your say now again as you you commented before with your confessions and I would like to ask you what are we looking for what would constitute a good performance from students in doing this task specifically perhaps what language areas uh, how will we know that they've completed the task well or partially or not so well what are the criteria that we are looking for in order to say this student did it well this student did it not so well and this student didn't effectively complete the task so a couple of minutes uh, and your answers in the uh, in the have your say box please exactly so we'll give you a little bit of time to answer that question uh, on the TOEFL primary speaking test which is done online on on the computer what are we looking for and somebody has already written in thank you fluency that fast okay yes that's one criteria the criterion um okay lots of ideas coming in sequencing ideas and giving instructions ordering ideas again yeah connectors yeah that's coming up a lot connectors and sequencing yeah communicating effectively communicating the mm -hmm. idea well okay so yes I think oh. they seem to be along the, <coughs> yes and good structure and sequence of events use of vocabulary sentence structures excellent great yeah that's all that's all great some of it is not quite specific enough I mean the broad idea definitely we're looking for fluency we're looking for vocabulary we're looking for connectors I mean connectors is quite uh, I would say quite uh, specific but uh, you know what uh, constitutes fluency at this particular level for example um, what co what constitutes good structure and sequencing of events uh, sequencing ideas and tenses which tenses Gr I mean great you're you you've I think identified all of the areas uh, however we're lucky because we can go further than that because if we go here we see this is from the the handbook that accompanies you can find this online uh, this is the official TOEFL primary handbook and it has the descriptors uh, and it has the what I like to call success criteria the criteria for success so what you need to do in order to be successful uh, at doing this task and it mentions pretty much the same things as you said so uh, coherence may be uh, assisted 
by the use of connecting devices. Fantastic. Loads of you said connectors. So great. The response is full and complete and speech is fluid and fairly smooth. And it mentions a confident rate of delivery and so on. Now, this is great. And this comes from the official source. So we know that this is what they're looking for. However, when I read this, and when I sit down and think about how I would do the task, what I like to do is to go a little bit further and analyze exactly what are the demands. And what I did, and I promise you, this took me about five minutes to create. I have the, the three areas here, the task completion. So what the, uh, the official document said was the response is full and complete. Now I would say, she or he mentions the four steps, mentions the steps in order, spoke for 30 seconds, which is the time that the candidate has, and possibly other things as well. When it comes to language, this is giving instructions. So we need to use not just verb tenses, but particularly imperatives. And in this case, things like go, take, and put uh, are likely to be the ones that you would, you know, you would go to straight away. Modals, you know, then you must then you need to, you have to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then linkers. So you did mention connectors. Uh, so if we have things like first, then next, finally, last, uh, this kind of thing. If an, you know, these exams are designed for students from between eight and 11 years old. If you have an eight, nine, 10 year old student who is using this language and using these connectors, no examiner would remain unimpressed. And probably most of your students at that age have the ability to do this if we coach them and direct them towards being able to do this. And fluency is the one which is, uh, you know, it's a little bit vague. This one's a little bit tricky. But if we have students saying things like, so, then you have to, okay, well, first of all, this kind of thing, these little fillers buy the student time to be able to think. And it leaves a very good impression. What doesn't leave such a good impression, and I'm sure I've done it a few times in this webinar so far, is saying, um, 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 because that's not communicating anything, right? There are some expressions that we might be able to teach our students, like, this is easy. First, you have to, and when they finish, that's all done. Also, when students self-correct, that can also be very impressive. So my what do i want to communicate with this we can brainstorm this kind of thing with the students we can guide them uh, if they're a bit dry and they're not coming up with the ideas then we can feed some of these ideas to them but if we really analyze the demands of the task if you give students to this and you put them in groups of three and you give one of them uh, the role of setting up the question asking the question another student the role of responding to the question and a third student you give them this rubric and they're paying attention to see how well their classmate is doing and then can give them some meaningful feedback and say okay you only spoke for 20 seconds okay you didn't use any connectors like first and next and finally then this is very very powerful because it's making them think about their own learning and making them think about the demands of the task and how to do it well and it will come to a stage where they will do it naturally and very easily because they're aware of it. And I promise you, okay, I'm, I'm quite experienced at doing this because I do this all the time. But uh, if you get into the habit of doing this kind of thing, then you can create rubrics or checklists like this very quickly. So this was our list, first of all, of the uh, five elements. We've done the first one. We've involved students in their own learning by giving them elements of choice and also by peer assessment and self-assessment and uh, participating in creating the assessment criteria and also by evaluating, them, evaluating themselves and each other. So next is increasing motivation and self-esteem. And this is really changing of um, our mindset. We think of assessment quite often as something they have to do to get results. But if we think about it as a chance for them to show off what they know, what they can do or how they've evolved, then I think this is an important switch and maybe you know makes uh, gives them a, a more positive outlook on assessment. 
And I'm not sure how aware you are of the idea of the growth mindset, but uh, just to summarize, it's the growth mindset is that I may not be the best. I, if I compare myself to a classmate, I might not be as good as them. Uh, but I can always be better than I am at the moment. With hard work, I can always improve. And making mistakes and a poor result and getting something wrong is an opportunity for learning. And, um, you know, I think if we can have this mindset for ourselves and for our students uh, and sell this idea to them and make it transparent to them that they have evolved and they have improved, then this can have a very powerful effect, I think. So we've done the first two, motivation and self-esteem by making them aware of their small incremental progress, no matter how small it is. Look, you couldn't do this two weeks ago and now you do it a little bit better. That is inherently motivating. So now I want to move on to three and four, which are kind of related really. They're, they're both related to feedback. Now, feedback, again, has six criteria. Um, so it should be corrective. You know, they should have corrective information. Uh, it should be timely. It should happen in a short space of time between being assessed or between doing a task and receiving the feedback. The longer you leave it, the less meaningful that feedback is. It should be critical. You know, it's not just as, a, oh, great, well done, 9.5. No, great, well done, 9.5. If you'd done this, it would have been a 10. Or the only thing that's missing is this. Being specific. Um, well done, good job is not specific enough. What's good? Why is it a good job? What to do next? Um, if uh, assessment is an ongoing, continuous process, then there is something to do between now and the next time. And obviously that is predicated on multiple events, not just one-off testing. Now I've chosen an image here. You'll see that there is a rear view mirror and there is a blurry foreground. So what's clearer is what's in the mirror and what's in front is a little bit more blurry. So taking into account the image that I've chosen to represent feedback, again, I'm going to ask you a question now for you to respond to. Why do you think I chose that image to represent feedback? And again, just a minute or so in your answers in the have your say box, please. Okay. So the question is now on your screen. Why do you think Matthew chose the following image or the image we've just seen to represent feedback? And I will, I will try and not say what I think at the moment mm -hmm. because, um, but I'm, I'm tempted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of a roadmap. Ah, okay. And somebody is nice. saying to focus. Okay, so it's giving. I presume that they, they're talking about the. The, 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 the road ahead uh, uh -huh. path to follow. Uh, another person is saying, because it's related to something in the past, uh, ah, where we are going will change depending on where we have been and what we have done. What we have learned is clear and what is to come is not. Wow, I uh, love these responses. Oh, wow, yes. There's a lot of thought going on here. Some of Great. them are better than what I'm going to say, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, what, but what I'm going to say is, is a nice play on words. And if I just go back to the slide, actually, um, the thing is that feedback, and it's in the name, feedback so often does not feed forward. And mm. if it doesn't feed forward, if it doesn't look to the road ahead, then it's actually not that useful. So here's what you did well, here's what you didn't do so well, that's the end. No, the feedback loop, and the, the clue is in the name, is that it has to feed forward. It has to focus on what the student does now and what the student can do next time. So I think if we keep this idea in mind, that if we change the name and instead of calling it feedback, called it feed forward, I think it, okay. it would change our conception of it and it would be, uh, it would be very, very useful. So we've done the first four now. And the next thing is, uh, again, related to this feedback, allowing for adjustment. So it's 
diagnosis, it's analysis for us, and it is for our students as well. And there's this idea of, uh, of WASPAC. Now, I see we're, we're running out of time a little bit. I'm, I'm taking a bit longer than I expected. So I was going to ask you the question here, but as I'm going to tell you what it is anyway, uh, I think I'm going to just skip ahead and tell you about this. Um, WASPAC sounds very related to feedback, um, and it's related particularly to this. And it's the effect that testing has on teaching and on learning. So the idea is if you have a, a test, an exam, an assessment task, if it's an external one, then that can influence very heavily the way that you teach. So let me give you an example. Now, if we have uh, the uh, selectividad or EBAU, EBAU for English does not have a speaking test. Now, WASPAC refers to those conditions influencing the teaching. As there is no oral test, it takes away the incentive for teachers and students to practice and to work more on uh, speaking in the classroom, right? Now, if there were a speaking exam for EBAU, that would drastically change the teaching that goes on in high school, I'm convinced, okay? And there would be much more focus on uh, speaking rather than on uh, grammar activities, reading comprehension, uh, and so on, right? So the thing about something like the TOEFL exam is that if the test is good, which it is, it has a positive effect on the teaching and the learning because some people speak badly of, of exams. Oh, you're just teaching to the test. You're just preparing them for the exam. But if the tasks on the exam are useful and meaningful, then preparing them for them is going to improve their thinking and going to prove their, improve their language level as well. If the test is poor, obviously this has a more negative effect because teachers, te teachers focus on passing a test and the test doesn't really uh, include many useful skills, okay? Now, I'm hoping to demonstrate this to you with a couple of examples from the TOEFL exam. Uh, and what we have here is the, uh, this is from the primary exam, and we have two different reading questions. And again, in have your say now, this is my question to you. Um, I'd like you to answer, uh, answer the questions. I don't need you to answer the questions in the have your say. Uh, I'd like you to answer the questions for yourself. But what I'd like you to write when it comes up on the screen now, have your say, is how do you know that the answers are correct? What are the strategies and what are the techniques uh, and the tactics that you are employing in order to get to the right answer? Okay, so we'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. That's on your screen now. So how do you know um, that what you're doing is correct? How do you know or how do you get to the right answer, as, as Matthew said, in relation exactly. to these questions? And so the, the point here is that... Bias. Go ahead, yes. No, sorry, the, the point here is that, uh, you know, we are all experienced readers and we employ strategies and techniques, perhaps without being aware that we're doing it because it just comes so naturally to us now. Uh, but being conscious and being aware of this, our learners are not experienced readers necessarily, and it's something that we can pass on to them. It's a, it's a shortcut, no? Exactly. So we'll just give people a little bit of time. I'm just thinking, I'm looking at it myself, and I'm thinking of um, skimming, scanning, uh, uh -huh. underlying... Um, particularly, well, in reading tasks, it's something I've done in my teaching as well, getting yep. students to highlight the key words, both in the question, um, or key parts of the question, and then relating that back to the text, um, uh -huh. reading for gist first, and then looking at the specific mm. questions. I mean, there are lots of different strategies. People are saying, Alexander, thank you, Alexander. Using photos, look for key words, read twice. Mm -hmm. Jesus Roldan is saying, reading in advance, the question <coughs> on, on underlining. Mm -hmm. And another person is revising questions and answers and then reading the text again. Of course, that process of going back and checking uh -huh. your answers, checking that. Exactly, that's yeah, this is correct. 
All of these are Absolutely. valid, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and if we go on to the next slide now, I mean, I'll, I'll, it doesn't matter whether you got the right answers or not. There was some, some pressure to do this here. Um, but, you know, here are the answers, and this is, this is what we do. I mean, I, I personally um, don't, when I give students practice tests to do, I have the answers close to me, but I don't look at the answers. I do it myself so that I can be aware of how I did it and I can ask my students how they did it and I can share my strategies which I which I think work now um, uh, Louise mentioned skimming and scanning I this is what I did I read the questions first I read question one first and then I skimmed and skimming is what we do in real life uh, I read the newspaper online every day but I don't read every headline and every article from top to bottom I glance over all of the headlines I skim over them some of them capture my attention and I click and I go in with some expectations and I skim first of all I read very quickly over the top and I get a general idea of what the text is about and if in my skimming it turns out that I was right then I read the article more in, in, in more detail okay so what I've done there is I've read as, as Louise said I've read for gist I've got a general idea of the meaning I've skimmed and then I read or not depending on what I find now in other types of text I, I might do quite the opposite I know exactly what the text is about I don't know let's say it's a it's a menu for example and I know that for example I don't eat meat so when I read a menu uh, I scan I am looking for keywords I am looking for things that don't contain meat uh, and that's a that's that's a strategy that I use right now if we look at the other uh, the other uh, question it's it looks quite different in nature and actually what's happens what happens here is the questions are kind of reversed the first one requires scanning and the second one requires skimming so what's back if a test is like this and it requires good reading strategies in order to do well our preparing the students for the tech for the, the tasks and making explicit to them how we do it and how they should do it is preparing them to be good readers and the good news is is that by making explicit which we tend to do a little bit more in the foreign language that can actually feed into what they do in the mother tongue as well so good tests like this uh, have this great washback effect because they teach or we need to teach the students strategies which are useful for them in order to be able to to perform well and as a byproduct as a secondary effect they get those skills forever so we've kind of done the five things here really that we need for uh, formative assessment we've involved them in their learning by giving them choice uh, and help it, or you know asking them to collaborate and cooperate in the formulation of assessment criteria where possible in the classroom obviously for external exams not so possible um, we've talked about increasing their motivation and self-esteem by making them aware uh, we've given them choice I forgot to mention we've given them choice over what we can take into account so you know how do we average the marks do we give them the option of uh, of not counting one of their marks because it wasn't very good that day we give them feedback which is timely which is uh, constructively critical which is precise which gives them information on how to improve and how to do better in the future and we use things like external exams to get concrete results which can help us change our, our teaching and therefore our students learning in the future so what we have here and and, and this to, to kind of conclude is the uh, is what I call the positive assessment cycle and starting in the top left the first thing we need to do is to teach students how to do things we have to teach them how to communicate effectively and complete certain tasks using certain types of language and speaking in a particular way we need to teach them how to analyze texts and the strategies to use in order to get them uh, to the right answer uh, and when we do that and when we've prepared them for this then we can test them or they can test themselves by exploiting peer uh, assessment or self-assessment when they have been assessed by us 
or by their classmates using common criteria, then we give them meaningful feedback which will help them improve. As a diagnostic tool, this is very useful. It helps them reflect on their learning, but it helps, helps us crucially reflect, reflect on their learning and know what we need to do next and speculate on changes we might need to make uh, in our teaching. And then we modify our teaching in accordance to that. And then we start all over again as their level gets higher and higher and we, you know, we, we continue teaching them things, we continue testing, we continue uh, this metacognitive journey by giving each other feedback and so on, uh, reflecting and again making changes based on the results. So this is a very powerful cycle, I think, and this is very different from teaching, 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 testing, teaching, 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 testing, uh, which would be summative. This is formative. This is assessment for learning, and external exams can play a very important role in that. So that brings me to the end of my uh, to the end of my talk, to the end of this webinar. If you have any questions now, or any comments, or anything that you'd like to say please do send your question. I'd be very uh, happy to answer them or very happy to, uh, to, to, to hear any of, your, any of your feedback. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, um, Matthew. That was very, very motivating, very, very powerful message, I think. Assessment thank for you. learning. Um, so yes, as Matthew said, uh, you have an opportunity now to send in any feedback that you have, any comments, or you may have a question um, and we can we can try and answer those questions. Um, there will be an online questionnaire in a minute where you can give more detailed feedback, of course. Uh, somebody is saying thanks for everything. So thank you very much, Matthew. Um, oh, thank you. Very positive, constructive feedback. Um, lots of thank yous coming in. That's great. Well, thank you to everybody. Thank you very, very much for participating. You've been really great in the different interactions in the poll and the have you says that we launched. It's really, really good um, to have you, the, your feedback. Alexandra, thank you for your comment. This would be great for parents, absolutely. Very powerful message to give to parents, um, to give real feedback and, and, and show as students, pupils and students um, progress. Um, another person saying, this was so useful. Thank you, Matthew. I would love to rewatch this and take notes. Well, you can. Yes, there will be a Great. video record of this. We, are, we have recorded the, the event. And as I said at the beginning, we will uh, send you an email in about one week's time with the, uh, a link to the recording of today's event so that you can go back and watch Matthew's talk and, and take notes as, as, as you wish. Uh, we will also send you your certificate of attendance as well as um, the handout, which is a summary of the main points and ideas that uh, Matthew has put forward in his talk today. Um, excellent. And Pat, Thank you, Pat. Sometimes good individual feedback isn't done because of the lack of time. And that's true. We are under that's pressure. A great, that's a great comment, Pat. And that's where I think peer assessment can be very useful as well, because, uh, you know, everybody is aware of the same criteria. And, um, you know, if, if your classmate is giving you some feedback, at least you're getting qualitative feedback. And it doesn't necessarily all have to come from the teacher, right? Exactly. I also wanted to, I also wanted to uh, respond to an anonymous question here. Do you do you ever ask the students to create sp specific questions to include in a test? Yes, I love the idea of. Uh, often I get groups of students to create tests for other groups of students. So if they're sitting on a table of four or five or six students, I get them to create a kind of test that they will then pass to the next table. So every, every group creates a test for, uh, for another group in the class. And it's a great metacognitive exercise because it forces them, it makes them think about what's tricky about this topic, what's difficult, what did I have trouble with, what might be difficult for them. Um, you know, they'll probably try and do some assessment with traps. They'll be a bit guilty of that because 
you know, it's fun and it's competitive, but that is certainly something I think which can be very powerful, yes. Absolutely. And another person um, is asking, what do you think about inviting our students to participate in the design of our assessment rubrics? I think you, you said that it is a very powerful um, um, tool to involve them in the design of the, of, of the rubrics. And you talked about brainstorming um, mm -hmm. criteria yeah. with, with the students. Um, so I think your answer th to that question would be yes, definitely. Definitely yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, and Jesus Roldan is saying thanks a lot. He's also saying the way you taught me and assessed me or us and him and his fellow students at the UAH and the UCC was one of the reasons that made me be become a an English teacher. Wow. Jesus, Jesus good to That's see you. Nice. It's nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's been a real pleasure. You've given us a lot to think about. And, and you've also, you've, I think you've shown that assessment can be such a powerful tool, such a positive tool in um, the teaching and learning cycle. So that um, it, it's beneficial to both students and teachers so that that's a wonderful very powerful message and thank you for sharing those ideas with us thank you to all of you out there for spending this hour with us for for sharing your ideas and the different interactions